Welcome back to the Discover Angkor Wat mini-series, a journey of discovery through the mystical Angkor. A vast and ancient city lost to the jungle 900 years ago. Countless ruins and temples extending over an area the size of modern-day New York, some even larger than any cathedral ever built. After years of archaeological studies, scientists know today that Angkor Wat was just a small part of one of the largest and most sophisticated cities in the world. Stunning wall reliefs and mysterious carvings give us clues about these forgotten people and the way they lived their lives. But who were these incredible people who built these large and sophisticated temples? And why was this huge metropolis suddenly abandoned to the jungle 900 years ago? Today, we're taking you with us on an incredible journey through the ruins of this mystical city. Come with us and discover the secrets lost to humanity for hundreds of years. This is the beginning of part two of our Discover Angkor Wat miniseries. If you haven't already watched part one, I would recommend pausing this video and clicking on the link you see on the screen right now for the first episode and returning to this one once you finish watching it. Otherwise, you can find the link for all the different episodes down below in the description. Our last episode ended up with us arriving at the very heart of Angkor Wat, the central sanctuary, which is enclosed within three layers of walls and surrounded by a maze of galleries around a central courtyard. From this courtyard, we reached the central sanctuary, climbing a set of very steep stairs, which are meant to represent the difficulty of reaching the kingdom of the gods. At the top of these stairs, we find a platform surrounded by narrow galleries with the five towers, one on each corner and the fifth being in the central position. Intricate carvings decorate these galleries, which divide the space into four smaller courtyards by cutting the space at right angles. At the junction of the four central galleries, the square base of the main tower contains a small shrine on each side, behind which we find a sacred core. Unlike most other temples in Angkor, Angkor Wat faces west, probably because it is oriented towards Vishnu. Initially Hindu and then Buddhist, this is the best preserved temple of the Angkor archaeological site and it is the only one to have remained an important religious center since its foundation. Right behind us you can see the famous city of Angkor Wat. That's the main temple, this, the actual Angkor Wat, which is separate or different from the overall site, which is also known as Angkor Wat. Now, something that completely baffles me and I can't get my head around it just yet, is that this place took 28 years to build. That's a long time. And 27 years later, after it was completed, the Khmer Empire, the people who built this place, lost a, a huge battle and their enemies sacked the city. Now the new emperor after the battle decided that since the Hindu gods to which the temple was originally dedicated to or the city was dedicated to and were the gods that supposedly were here to protect the city have failed the empire. So they decided to abandon the city and build a whole new one 
about 10 kilometers away, which we're gonna go visit now, and they dedicated that one to Buddhism. Now, as much as I, now as much as I understand the logic behind abandoning this giant place, because the gods have failed it. Let's just start anew, build something new, something bigger, better, just 10 kilometers that way. I don't know, maybe it makes sense to you, but to me, it seems like a, a little bit of a waste. I'm just, just saying. The Khmer are one of the oldest ethnic groups of Southeast Asia and arrived in the region probably from southern China over 4,000 years ago. They were one of the first people in the world to use bronze and to invent the number zero, and they developed the earliest alphabet still in use in Southeast Asia. The beginning of the Khmer Empire dates to the year 802 AD, when a great leader, Yahavarman II, would emerge and would unite the region. After crowning himself, Yahavarman, the supreme world emperor, king of kings. Through him, the new empire would become one of the world's great powers, and over the next 500 years, Yahavarman's descendants will rule the Khmer people. Considered a great king and an accomplished builder, Yahavarman was the man behind the construction of a new great city, Angkor. From the new city's foundations, the Khmer Empire grew and flourished until it became the most powerful in Southeast Asia. At its height, it covered an area that included much of today's Thailand and Cambodia, as well as Vietnam and Laos. At the heart of the empire was the mega city of Angkor. Since the 2nd century AD, the Khmer had practiced Hinduism. Like most of the kingdoms in Southeast Asia, they adopted India's hierarchical social structure based on caste. The Hindu myths and philosophies, and perhaps more importantly, the language of Sanskrit. Sanskrit was once a living language, but today it occupies a similar role to Latin in the European tradition. It is no longer spoken by ordinary people, but it has become a language of a scholarship and religion. At the time of the Khmer Empire, classical Sanskrit became the language used among the elite of Southeast Asia, just like Greek and Latin were once required learning among the European nobility. But while the elites, the wealthy and the nobles of Angkor were taught Sanskrit and Hinduism, most of the common people were not Hindu. They were either Buddhist or followed their own ancient rituals that asked favors of the spirit who lived in the trees and the mountains. This division between the wealthy Hindu nobles and the predominantly Buddhist beliefs of the common people would form a stress line across the Khmer society that would eventually lead to internal conflict and the weakening of the empire. We now know that less than 50 years after the construction of Angkor Wat, the Khmer Empire had been weakened following decades of internal fighting, and this presented an opportunity for the mortal enemy, the Cham Empire, to attack. The Cham armies were able to rampage through the Khmer lands and easily defeat its armies in battle. They burned the city of Angkor to the ground, destroyed its temples and palaces, and set fire to the wooden houses of its people, living in a smoking and desolate waste. Following this, in the year 1181, King Yohavarman VII 
ascended to the throne. After Jehovahman finally defeated the Sham in battle and returned to the capital, he found it in a state of great distraction. Its wooden houses were burnt, its gilded temples robbed, and its once opulent palace lying in ash and ruin. So he embarked on a building project that would have few equal in history and would turn the capital of the Khmer Empire into the envy of the world. Yahav Arman decided to rebuild the city in a part of Angkor that is known today as Angkor Thom, or the Great City. The new city was a perfect square of mathematical precision surrounded by a moat and enclosing an area of 9 square kilometers. And at the center is the Bayon Temple. There are many different buildings and temples within the Angkor archaeological site. Apart from Angkor Wat, the most impressive part is probably the royal city of Angkor Thom. That's our next destination. The royal city of Angkor Thom is shaped like a square with a site around 3 kilometers long and surrounded by an 8 meters high wall. In the middle of each of the four walls of the enclosure is a monumental gate decorated with giant faces of Brahma, the Hindu god of creation. This is the famous bridge that leads into the new city the one they built after Angkor Wat. That's where we're going now. Hopefully, it's bigger and better than the older Angkor Wat, but I don't know. Let's go find out. Each one of the gates can be reached by a white road that crosses the moat. The one leading to the south gate is guarded on each side by a row of 54 statues, the Jaksha. On the right side, we see the Devas who are the benevolent gods. On the left side are the Azuras, the demons. Both gods and demons pulling on a serpent of stone representing the shining of the sea of milk. The easiest way to get around Angkor is to hire a tuk-tuk and a driver for the day. It is difficult to fathom how large this site really is until you drive through it. With an average distance in between temples of one to two miles, it will be impossible to fully explore the site on foot, especially when you factor in the weather and how hot the Cambodian day can get. Thank you. Hiring a tuk-tuk for the day can be quite affordable at just $25 and it has the added advantage of providing you with a place to store your bags and gear as you explore the different sites. Inside the walls, the four gates are extended by perpendicular ways which meet at the center of the site where the Bayan Temple is located. The Bayan, a mountain-style temple, is the most impressive representation of the Baroque style of Khmer art. It was built on the model of a three-tier pyramid with a total height of 43 meters, and it contains an intricate maze of towers, terraces, and stairs. The structure once had 54 towers representing according to the legend, the 54 provinces of the Khmer Empire. The first two levels, which are square and decorated with wall reliefs, lead to the third circular level, where we find what's left of the imposing towers, each topped by the four-headed statues of Brahma. Brahma, who is usually represented by four heads, looking in four different directions is the Hindu creator God who made matter and the universe. You've been watching part two of our Angkor Wat mini-series. 
I'm sure you've enjoyed it so far and are super ready for part 3. So don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you're notified once the next video comes out. Next up, we will continue exploring the amazing Bayon Temple. We will also visit the incredible Priyakan Temple which served as a center for administration for the empire with over 100,000 workers and officials, as well as discover many other interesting sites. So stay tuned for more of this amazing adventure. And once again, I'm glad you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.